The Westies were a small Irish-American gang that operated in the Hell's Kitchen neighborhood in New York. This gang struck fear throughout New York, even intimidating some of the most powerful mafia bosses. They were at their peak of power throughout the 1970s and 1980s, using brutal tactics to get what they wanted. Many brutal clashes arose, with the Westies believed to be responsible for 60 to 100 murders during this era. This gang even came close to wiping out one of the most powerful Italian mafia bosses and his crew. In today's video, we're going to delve into the history of the Westies. We'll take a look at how this small gang made their mark on the criminal underworld of New York. With their rise to power, also came downfall. Throughout this video, we'll also explore some of the Westies' notorious internal conflicts and clashes with other crime gangs. We're also going to take a look at where this gang stands today if they're still operating. Before we can tell you about what happened to the Westies, we need to go back to where it all began. Let's begin with how the Westies started on the streets of Hell's Kitchen. In the 1940s, Hell's Kitchen was an appealing area for immigrants. There were low rent rates, giving people a chance for a fresh start in the U.S. But as the neighborhoods filled up, conflicts were ignited within the community. Although Hell's Kitchen was growing, jobs were significantly scarce. Many people were struggling to get by, and living conditions were harsh. This led to crime rates in the area skyrocketing. Small crime groups were beginning to take over the area. As more Irish immigrants settled in the area, a new crime group arose. It was believed to be in the 1960s that the Westies emerged. The group's original leader was Mickey Spillane. At this point in time, there was a power vacuum for crime in Hell's Kitchen. Prior to the gang's emergence, there was a crackdown on crime in the area. This led to a lot of previous gang leaders fleeing the area. Mickey and his crew were able to come in and take control over rackets and other organized crime. Mickey was known for running various criminal operations, from underground gambling to loan sharking but one of his most notorious operations was the Snatch Rackets. Members of the Westies would kidnap local businessmen and hold them for ransom. People had a lot of reasons to fear Mickey and the Westies, but a lot of people in Hell's Kitchen also respected him. Mickey was well known for his generosity. He supplied flowers and gifts to locals when they were in the hospital and was also known to donate food to the needy around the holidays. His acts of generosity helped cement Mickey's status with the public in Hell's Kitchen. But things got even better for him when he married Maureen McManus. She came from the family that ran the Midtown Democrat Club. With political power on his side, Mickey was able to take more control and move criminal operations into the business world. While things may have looked good for Mickey, darkness was looming in the shadows. Many people were affected by his snatch rackets, and some were looking to seek revenge. Jimmy Coonan was an enemy that Mickey Spillane didn't know he had but one of his snatch rackets involved kidnapping Jimmy's father. The teenager hadn't forgotten about it and was determined to get his revenge. In 1966, when Jimmy was 18, he waited atop a tenement building for a sighting of Mickey and his associates. When they arrived on the scene, he fired a machine gun at them. His aim was off and nobody was injured at the time, but he wasn't finished yet. Jimmy ended up doing some time in prison and was released in 1971. At this point, he had already established himself in the criminal underworld of Hell's Kitchen. He had worked his way up the ranks of the Westies. Mickey no longer felt safe in Hell's Kitchen, so he moved out of the way to a neighborhood in Queens. This left room for Jimmy Coonan to take over as the gang's boss. However, some members of the Westies still viewed Mickey as the official boss. He was also in control of the Javits Convention Center, a construction site that gave him a lot of power. But someone else had their sights on this center, Anthony Salerno, a high-ranking member of the Genovese crime family. He decided to cut a deal. If Jimmy became the official boss of the Westies and let him control Javits, then Anthony would cut him a share of the profits. With this deal set in motion, Anthony did what most made men would do, eliminate his competition. He hired Joseph Sullivan, a hitman from the Buffalo crime family, to take out three of Mickey Spillane's main supporters, Edward Comiskey, Tom Devaney, and Tom Capatos. At this point, Jimmy had all the power in his hands. There was just one problem. He knew Mickey could take it back if he wanted, so when an offer came up to get him out of the way, Jimmy couldn't refuse. In 1977, Jimmy Coonan took out Charles Ruby Stein, a shady loan shark who had connections to the Genovese and Gambino families. 
This was a risky assassination, but there was a lot of money on the line for Jimmy if he was able to pull it off. While Jimmy's crew kept their silence about the murder, there was someone who knew what Jimmy did. That was Roy DeMeo, a hitman for the Gambino family. Roy could have used this information to blackmail Jimmy. Instead, he used it to further their ties. Jimmy Coonan was a smart and violent man. He was someone that the Gambino family could use to their advantage, especially if he was officially running the Westies. So Roy proposed an offer. He would take care of Mickey and offer the Westies protection from the Gambino family. In exchange, the Westies would take on contracts for hits to take out the Gambino's rivals and give over 10% of their profits from operations in Hell's Kitchen. With this new degree of protection, the Westies were able to expand their criminal activities throughout Hell's Kitchen. They were also able to use this allyship to engage deeper into New York's criminal underworld. From drug trafficking to murder-for-hire contracts, this criminal network continued to grow. But Jimmy had a reputation for being violent and unpredictable. He was a force to be reckoned with, especially when it came to conflicts with territory or business. One such conflict almost resulted in him taking out a mafia boss and their associates. In the late 1970s, Ruby Stein's body was discovered. This brought some unwanted attention to the mafia, and there were rumors that the Westies had something to do with it. For this reason, the Gambino family boss, Paul Castellano, called Jimmy in for a meeting at a restaurant. But Jimmy wasn't taking this lightly. He needed to have a plan in action. He brought his main associate, Mickey Featherstone, with him. Along with that, he also had a team of Westies waiting on standby at a nearby bar. They were armed with machine guns and grenades and told to assassinate everyone in the building if Jimmy and Mickey weren't out of there within two hours. As the meeting took place, Jimmy and Mickey denied any involvement in the Loan Shark's murder. They also further discussed a deal with Paul Castellano that would increase their profits. With this new deal underway, they sat down for dinner and lost track of time. After two hours, Jimmy realized the time and was struck with fear. He excused himself, worried that the restaurant would blow up at any moment. However, when he arrived at the bar where his team was, he found them surrounded by drinks. They decided to wait it out and have one more round before taking action. The Westies were known for their violent antics, and things went to a whole new level with Jimmy Coonan in power. But the way this gang rose to the top is exactly how they came crumbling down. Ruthless and unpredictable violence could only get them so far. In the world of crime, things only stay good for so long. This is especially true for people who get power hungry. Being at the top, Jimmy was a constant threat to those around him. This led to a power struggle within the Westies. Many members of the crew wanted him out, but none of them were brave enough to do it. Ties were beginning to crumble within the Gambino family. Roy DeMeo was Jimmy's main contact within the crime family. The notorious hitman was assassinated in 1983. A few years later, Paul Castellano was taken out by members of the Gambino family in 1985. John Gotti stepped into power, and he had some brutal tactics of his own. Unlike Paul, he was less interested in keeping ties strong with the Westies. One major internal rift caused the most strife between the Westies. Jimmy started showing more loyalty to younger members of the crew, and his main ally Mickey Featherstone was catching on to this. But one move Jimmy made severed his allyship with Mickey once and for all. Jimmy offered his longtime ally a murder-for-hire contract, but Mickey turned it down. So Jimmy hired another hitman, only he arranged for this hitman to dress up like Mickey. They made sure there were witnesses so this crime could be pinned back to Mickey. Mickey was booked for the crime and looking at 25 years to life. However, this time it was a crime he didn't commit, but he knew who set him up. That's when he decided to cooperate with the authorities to bring in his old accomplices. His wife Sissy was in on the plan to act as a witness and bring down the Westies. While Mickey was in prison, Three members of the gang, Kevin Kelly, Billy Boken, and Kenny Shannon, would stop by the Featherstones' house to give Sissy support money. She would strike up conversations with these men and get them talking about their criminal operations. All of these conversations were recorded. At one point, she got them talking about the setup, and Billy Boken admitted to knowing who the real killer was, a man named James Hawley. This was the beginning of the crackdown on the Westies. Jimmy Coonan and several other associates were brought to trial in 1986. The Westies' unpredictable boss was sentenced to 75 years in prison for his part in seven murders, racketeering, and several other criminal charges. With Jimmy Coonan and several other key players in prison, things had changed dramatically for the Westies. 
this was the beginning of the end of the gang's wrath. Some of the members that were able to avoid jail time attempted to start a new life, but many of them were unable to start fresh as they had legal troubles following them. The fall of the Westies was the beginning of the rise of Hell's Kitchen. High crime rates began to drop significantly, making the area more appealing to people looking for a fresh start. New businesses opened up, new real estate developments took off, and new residents felt comfortable moving to the neighborhood. Hell's Kitchen was no longer the territory of brutal criminals. It transformed into a vibrant and growing community. In 1986, many key players of the Westies were sentenced to prison. Kevin Kelly and Kenny Shannon fled when the trial began. While they weren't sentenced with the rest of the Westies, they didn't stay on the run for long. They eventually turned themselves in and were sentenced to 50 years in prison, but had the time reduced to 40 years. Mickey Featherstone had his time significantly reduced because he cooperated as an informant. He pleaded guilty to racketeering charges and was sentenced to five years in prison. However, his time was reduced and he was freed in 1988 when he entered the Witness Protection Program. The Westies are a significant part of New York's criminal underworld's history. Although this gang is less known than the Italian Mafia families, they have made their mark. Several books and films have detailed the internal conflicts and brutal nature of this gang. One of the most popular is the book The Westies, Inside New York's Irish Mob by T.J. English. This book was released in 1990 and still captivates readers to this day. While the brutal era of the Westies came to an end in the 1990s, was this the final straw for the crime group as a whole, or are they still running operations today? The legacy of the Westies is still strong in Hell's Kitchen, but their criminal activities are far out of sight. As far as the public knows, the Westies are no longer a criminal gang in 2024. Many of its key members are now dead, in prison, or have moved far past that lifestyle. However, there has been public interest in this gang over recent years, as documentaries and media coverage sparked conversation about the crimes of the gang's past. Former members have even been scrutinized for their association with violent criminals. While the Westies may be a colorful part of Hell's Kitchen's past, the area has become a lot more peaceful in recent decades. The lore of the Westies will forever be cemented into Hell's Kitchen's history. When this criminal gang emerged in the 1960s, they were able to seize control of power in the area. Previous gangs had been chased out of the neighborhood, providing an open path for Mickey Spillane and his crew to take over. But one of Mickey's vicious kidnapping rackets earned him the wrong enemy, Jimmy Coonan. Jimmy may have been a kid at the time, but he grew up to be one of the most unpredictable and violent men in Hell's Kitchen. With revenge on his mind, he was determined to take over the Westies and get Mickey out of the way. As he climbed up to the top of this gang, he made some allies and enemies along the way. While he was able to get the gang in the good books with the Gambino family, he managed to upset some of his own, causing internal strife within the Westies. As Jimmy got greedier with power, he turned on one of his top associates, Mickey Featherstone, and tried to frame him for murder. This was all the fuel his former ally needed to act as a witness and tell authorities everything he knew about the Westies. Ultimately, this led to Jimmy and several other members' arrests and the downfall of the gang. Thank you so much for staying with us to the end of the video. We hope you enjoyed today's video and can't wait to share more Mafia stories with you. Make sure you hit like, share, and subscribe to see more Mafia Mystique content.